Welcome back to Equity TV. I'm your host, Christine Dan. College can improve the quali quality of life for someone economically and socially. And there's no better example than defense attorney David Torres. Welcome, David. Thank you. Thank you for having me. So a lot of people know you as a rock star in the courtroom. But underneath that sharp suit lies a man with some humble beginnings, right? Well, I'm not sure about the rock star, but uh, <laughs> yes, I do have very humble beginnings. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, um, it's interesting. My father was from Mexico. My mother uh, was born uh, here in, in uh, California, but uh, my mother was given away at a, at a young age because her mother died giving uh, childbirth. And she was given up to a couple of individuals. The, the, her mother was uh, Latina, her stepmother, and the father was Filipino. So they, ra they were raised, in, she was raised in a boarding school. My father came over to the United States at the age of 17. Ultimately, at this boarding house, uh, they ended up meeting, and as a result of meeting, they uh, got married. So um, we were migrant farm workers pretty much all my life. My father ultimately retired as a farm worker, as well as my mother. And did you grow up in the fields as well? Yes. In fact, uh, the earliest memories that I recall uh, when I wasn't in school or I was out of school, basically being four or five years old, and, you know, obviously I couldn't pick at that particular time, but, you know, if we were picking olives, for example, I had to go down underneath the trees and pick up the olives that had fallen or the oranges or uh, at that age we uh, picked table grapes so we would have to lay out the, the um uh, lay out the paper and, and spread the grapes so that they could ultimately turn into raisins. So, you know, pretty much did that. Oh, wow. And where did you do that at? Well, we were migrant farm workers. So generally the, the way it worked is that once school was out, uh, the day school was out, we would uh, pack up our 1967 station wagon. We would get all of the kids in there. My mother would uh, pack lunch and breakfast. And we'd travel to Stockton. And once we arrived at Stockton, we would live out in, in the uh, orchards, um, and unfortunately, at that time, there were no laws with respect to uh, toilets and things of that ever. So you can imagine, you know, having to use a shovel from time to time. But we picked um, cherries, and we cooked out there as well. And after doing that, we'd travel up north to the Dells, Oregon, pick cherries. We'd go into Washington and ultimately uh, go back around to Wenatchee, pick some grapes, come back. And the, uh, when school started, then that's when we uh, pick uh, grapes over here again. So there were many times as well, before we went to class, uh, we would have to get up early in the morning and uh, depending on the season, pick grapes or pick olives and my, our mother would bring us back in time uh, to start school. Wow, so that's a long day for you. Your day would start at what time? Two uh, in the morning? We would probably get up, no, we'd probably get up about 4.30 in the morning and, and uh, the sun would be, the sun would rise around 5, 5.30 in the morning and we'd pick until about 7, 7.15. My mother, you know, some of these uh, orchards were close to our house so we'd drive back and get ready to go to school and she'd bring us to school. Then, of course, when school was out, she'd pick us up and we'd go out and pick again. Oh my gosh, so when did you ever have time to study? Well, we... Once we got home, my parents were very rigid about school. Uh, they wanted all of us to have a good education. And so uh, whenever we got home, we, of course, had to hit the books. And um, they were very strict about that. As a matter of fact, uh, I went to parochial school. So knowing Catholic school, one can imagine the tremendous amount of homework that we had to do. So my family, what in order for us to afford Catholic school back then is my mother had to, apart from her job, you're thinking about our job being difficult, my mother also had to uh, clean the convent and cook for the nuns and clean the rectory and cook for the priests as well. So, you know, that was the way that they were able to reduce the cost for us to attend Catholic school. Wow, so she was working around the clock. She was, basically. but you know what? That really taught me about relationships themselves because my father wasn't the typical macho Mexican type of gentleman. In fact, uh, he would actually uh, get home and he would sweep the house, clean it, and at times prepare food for us. Um, and he felt that it would be, it was, it was his duty to do that while my mother was doing that for the nuns and the priests. So how did that lifestyle growing up motivate you educationally? Well, you know, one of the things that I remember when I was a young man is that my father, when I would be out in the fields, um, he always considered me to be a very hard and fast worker. Um, but he would tell people that I was going to uh, be a lawyer and the governor of California. And um, of course, he was correct on one of them. But uh, my father was, despite having a uh, fourth grade education, 
is probably you know one of the smartest men I know, and he was always involved in politics. And one of the things that he really instilled upon me is is education. And my my mother was the same way too. They, she wanted us to go to school. She wanted me particularly to be a lawyer as well. Oh wow! So would you say your father was a driving force behind your success? <clears throat> You know, my mother and father were a driving uh, force. The thing about my father, though, is that um, my grandfather spent 30 years, actually 34 years, six months in the Mexican Army. And so my father, <clears throat> my father was the type of individual who um, wanted, enjoyed the military. He couldn't join the military in Mexico simply because my grandfather wouldn't allow him to. But my father uh, always felt that there should be a commitment because he came over here illegally uh, from Mexico. Ultimately, obviously, he became a lawful permanent resident. But he felt that we owed so much to this country that it was incumbent upon him to ensure that all of his sons joined the military. And me being the oldest, he encouraged me or forced me to agree <laughs> to join the Marine Corps. My other brothers joined the Army. And your mom wasn't very happy, I'm sure. Well, no, I, and that's a good story because <laughs> what I'd done is I joined, I uh, enlisted for a four-year tour in the Marine Corps uh, at the age of 17. And my father took me down to the Marine Corps office. Well, my father uh, is monolingual in Spanish, doesn't read or write English, doesn't speak English, and to this day, after being in this country for so long, he still doesn't. But uh, when my mother came home, um, I told her what had happened, and I was very happy, and, hey, I'm going to the Marine Corps. And she says, no, you're not. And she uh, went down to the recruiter's office and basically made them tear up that contract. But we reached a compromise because she said I could be in the Marine Corps Reserve so long as I attend college, which was Fresno State, where I'd have been accepted. And from there, you became uh, an, a, was a lieutenant colonel in the Army. Well, I um, spent my four years at Fresno State as a, as a Marine. Uh, ultimately, I uh, was honorably discharged as a uh, sergeant, and I was already up in Washington State by the time that happened. But um, after that, I had earned a scholarship to study law at Gonzaga University after Fresno State. And that was uh, 1983, and I went up to Gonzaga University, and while I was there, I did something crazy. My first year, is probably, you're supposed to dedicate your entire life to the law. But um, I joined the uh, ROTC program at Gonzaga. Oh. And in my second year of law school, I was commissioned as a second lieutenant in the infantry. And ultimately, I uh, served, I, I told you my grandfather served 34 years, six months. I served a, to a total of 34 years, five months. Uh, in both the Marine Corps, and I completed with the rank of lieutenant colonel in the Army as a judge advocate general. You had one more month to go. You know, and I, did, <laughs> and I didn't realize until after I had done that, and I thought, darn, you know, if I just only stayed one more month. Yeah. So how about combat? Did you tell us about that? No, I, well, I never went to combat. Actually, I was, as a Marine uh, Reserve, there was nothing really going on back then. Uh, I was an infantry officer. I was fortunate to have gone through airborne school and infantry school. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I, was a, I, was, I served as a reservist. What ultimately happened, however, is that when we were, uh, during the first Desert Storm War, we were pretty much an infantry unit training to go out and, you know, staged to go out ultimately. But a funny thing happened when the war started. It only lasted, I think, two or three days. And so after that, uh, we ended up having to wind down. But I, that never happened. But ultimately, I got out, and I was in the inactive ready reserve for approximately six years. And I received a call in 1999 to go back in. And I applied for the JAG Corps, and I went back in. And I had some excellent, excellent uh, opportunities when I went, returned as a JAG. And I had an opportunity to go to various countries and, and serve. So how did that all influence your career in law? Well, you know, one of the things of being a judge advocate is it allowed me to learn military law, but not only that, I took it to another level. Because when, when we started getting activated back in 2003 after 9-11, uh, a lot of the soldiers that I was working with and I wasn't aware of, they were what we call green card soldiers. Green card soldiers are, are, lawfully, uh, are lawful permitted uh, residents. They're allowed to remain in the United States. They're just the only thing that they don't have is citizenship, but they are allowed to join the military. And so uh, I was receiving emails from a lot of the soldiers that I had uh, worked up in terms of doing their wills, powers of attorney, and working with their families and preparing to get deployed. 
when I learned that they would arrive in uh, either Kuwait or Iraq or, and, or Afghanistan, and they're telling me that they can't do the jobs that they were trained to do. And the reason why is because they weren't citizens. And the Army's program at that time took about two and a half years in order to uh, change your status from, um, from lawful permanent resident to citizenship. And so my commander and I got together, and she worked for the INS, and we authored the uh, expedited citizenship program, which ultimately reduced the amount of time from two years, two and a half years, to um, six months. And, and then there were times that we were able to get people as, uh, uh, naturalized within 90 days. The fastest I did actually was 15 days. And it was funny because as I was working the procedure, our soldiers had been sent to El Paso, Texas to prepare to go to war. And right before they were getting on the plane, there were 15 of them that were taken out and somebody from INS came over, had them raise their hand, and they that was the biggest thing for them to do is to become citizens and get on that plane and go fight for our country. Well, call me biased, but I think you're a rock star in the courtroom. I've seen you in action. How, how has all of that come together to make you who you are today um, here in Bakersfield as, as such a prominent attorney? You know, one of the things that I, I realized at a very young age is that when I was, in, I believe it was in 1993, I tried a case. It was a huge case uh, called the Cottonwood Murder Trial. And the, the prosecutor in that case, he and I had known each other since college. And uh, it was a very intense and aggressive uh, trial, and it lasted for quite some time. But ultimately what happened is that, you know, we would, we would be fighting in the courtroom, and he had a habit of trying to cite me for, uh, you know, bad conduct, things of that nature. So uh, one time it got so heated that I, you know, I got a little bit too angry. But as I was following him out of court, I heard somebody say, hello, Mr. Barton. Uh, would you like to buy some Girl Scout cookies? And it was my daughter. She knew him. And he ended up purchasing, uh, said, hi, hi, Alexia. And they talked. And I could hear this. And I thought, OK, you know, you got to take things. You, can, you do your job seriously in the courtroom, but you've got to lighten up and understand that you still have a life to live out there. So my, my thing about it is obviously depolarizing any case that I have with the prosecutor, because they're, they're going to be an aggressive in an aggressive stance and expect everybody else's. Yes. But one of the things that I like to do is to get, is to humanize my client and understand their background and talk about how they can re rehabilitate and make life better and uh, how we can get it to be where they, the recidivism rate would be low with respect to them. But then again, you know, when I was a young attorney, I had a lot of trial experience because that's what you did back then. And the uh, penalties were not as high as they are today. Oh, or as severe. <laughs> well, thank you so much. We're going to take a short break, but after return, we return, we're going to talk to David a little bit more about um, it's a, pro a program you're starting at BC. Oh. And we'll be right back. Thank you very much.